At dawn, underground sensors at Campy Flay Gray registered a sudden surge, 100,000 tons of carbon dioxide flooding into the air, far more than experts believed possible for a single event. Traditional models said this could not happen here, and yet every reading pointed to disaster. If this is real, 500,000 lives now hang on what the evidence will reveal next. So how did the world's most watched volcano just break its own rules? Sentinel 5P satellite frames tagged S5P CF 0300 0700 captured the first signs of the anomaly. Their spectrometer bands showed a dense column of carbon dioxide stretching across the caldera. Each frame, time-stamped and geolocated, lined up with ground alerts in the INGV monitoring room. The satellite's shortwave infrared sensors, calibrated to detect volcanic gases, picked up values that exceeded the highest readings logged in four decades of observation. Raw data files, each with its own ID, fed directly into the analysis pipeline, with no time for interpretation, only the numbers and their sharp break from the expected. On the ground, f -Lyre thermal cameras stationed at Solfatara and Pichiarelli, including the unit registered as flrcf 9 recorded a sudden spike in surface temperatures and plume density. These cameras routinely checked for calibration drift and sensor accuracy, logged the event in real time. Their digital logs, cross-referenced by field technicians, showed a plume expanding outward, heat signatures fluctuating as carbon dioxide vented through new fissures. The provenance of each f -Lar file, camera serial, position, and timestamp was verified by INGV specialists to rule out sensor error or tampering. A Sentinel remote sensing specialist reviewing the satellite's Level 2 data confirmed the anomaly was not an artifact. The overlap between satellite and ground-based readings left little doubt. Both independent systems recorded the same surge, down to the minute. The evidence chain began with these raw frames and logs, each file a piece of the puzzle that would be used to calculate the total volume of gas released. For now, the numbers stood on their own anchoring the investigation in a trail of digital signatures and time-stamped records. On a stainless steel bench inside the INGV Geochemistry Lab, a technician loads a sealed vial into the gas chromatograph mass spectrometer. The sample comes straight from the plume, drawn by field teams during the early morning surge. Translating raw sensor data into a real-world number starts with column density, the amount of carbon dioxide in a vertical slice of air, measured in kilograms per square meter. Multiply that by the plume's height, tracked minute by minute through f -Lyr and satellite imagery, and by the expanding area mapped across the caldera. The equation is simple on paper. Flux equals column density times wind speed times plume area. But each variable carries its own margin of error. The result? is an estimated 100,000 tons of carbon dioxide, plus or minus 18% vented between 3 a.m. and 7 a.m. Lab results add a layer of complexity. The isotopic signature measured as delta 13 C lands at minus 1.3 per mil, typical for magmatic carbon dioxide. But the ratio of trace gases does not fit the usual pattern there is a higher-than-expected mix of hydrothermal and magmatic components, hinting at unusual interactions underground. The analyst double-checks the instrument calibration and reruns the sample, and the numbers hold. This is not a simple case of more gas. The chemistry itself is off-script. No single method can confirm the total on its own. Each step, satellite retrieval, ground-based thermal imaging, laboratory isotope analysis, carries its own uncertainty. Yet all lines of evidence converge on the same conclusion. The volume and chemical makeup of this release fall outside the range predicted by decades of monitoring. The data leave open questions, but the anomaly is real. The next step is independent verification, as outside labs prepare to replicate the findings. A data package leaves the INGV servers 
and lands on the desktop of Dr. Petra Newman, a satellite gas flux specialist at the GFZ German Research Center for Geosciences. Her team is known for independent audits of volcanic emissions across Europe. Within hours, they pull the raw Sentinel 5P Level 2 files, check the calibration logs, and rerun the atmospheric corrections using their own algorithms. The team cross-checks the column densities and wind vectors, confirming the plume's footprint matches both the Italian readings and the timestamps from the FLIR logs. Their calculations, run on a separate pipeline, arrive at a total carbon dioxide release of 102,600 tons, well within the 18% margin of error reported by the INGV laboratory. The audit does not stop at the numbers. Newman's group pulls in auxiliary data from the Copernicus Atmosphere Monitoring Service, looking for any conflicting signals or evidence of instrument drift. The satellite's geolocation matches the ground stations at Solfatara and Pichiarelli, and the thermal anomalies line up with the same four-hour window. Even the isotopic ratios, checked against archived samples from previous years, show the same magmatic fingerprint with the carbon isotope ratio Delta 13C hovering near minus 1.3 per mil. The only anomaly is the volume, never before recorded at this scale for Campy Flagre. Dr. Neumann signs off on the audit with a brief note, replication achieved within error bars, no evidence of sensor malfunction, and a recommendation for immediate seismic review. With the external confirmation locked in, the forensic chain is complete. Every step, satellite, ground, laboratory, and now third-party replication points to a release that defies decades of expectation. The next question is, what's happening beneath the surface to drive such a surge? Inside the INGV monitoring room, a wall of live seismograms scrolls past, each line tracing the pulse of the caldera. The system logs every tremor, hundreds each week, sorting background noise from true seismic swarms. Campy Flegre's baseline is restless, but patterns matter. During the period of the CO2 surge, analysts flag a cluster of shallow quakes, most less than magnitude 2, concentrated beneath Solfatara and Pichiarelli. The swarm count rises but never crosses into the chaos seen during major crises. Recent years have seen bursts of 80 or more events in a day, but this window hovers just above 50, enough to trigger internal review, but not public alarm. Seismologists focus on the B value, a statistical marker drawn from the Gutenberg-Richter relationship. A high B value means many small quakes. A low value hints at higher stress or changing rock properties. For Campy Flegre, the long-term average sits around 1.0, but recent analyses show localized dips to 0.9 and below in the days before the gas release. These changes are subtle, but in a system this complex, even small deviations become signals worth attention. Automated scripts flag the drop, and the duty scientist, Dr. Anna Tremelli, pulls up cross-sections of the swarm, mapping their depth and spread. Most events cluster at 2-3 to three kilometers, right where the hydrothermal system interfaces with deeper magma. Ground deformation data streams in from GPS and tilt meters. Pozzuoli's sensors register uplift rates of 3 to 4 millimeters per day, well above the historical average, but not at the runaway levels seen during the 1980s Brady Seism crisis. The caldera floor is rising, but steadily, not explosively. The real concern is acceleration, any sudden jump in uplift, paired with a sharp drop in B value or a spike in swarm frequency, could indicate a breach in the system or fresh magma rising. For now, the thresholds remain unbroken, but the convergence of signals, gas, quakes, and ground movement keeps the monitoring team on edge, watching for the next deviation from the norm. On the worn surface of a centuries-old map, the Campi Flegre Caldera sprawls in faded ink beneath the modern city of Naples. A historian traces the outline of the bay, pausing near Pozzuoli, where the ground does not sit still. The land here has always moved, 
rising and falling in slow, unpredictable pulses known as Bradyseaism. In the autumn of 1538, that movement became relentless. Parish records describe the earth swelling by several meters in just a few days, forcing residents to abandon homes as the, as the soil cracked beneath their feet. Fumaroles vented hot, stinking vapors across the fields, and livestock collapsed in the meadows. On September 29th, after weeks of upheaval, the ground split open and a new volcanic cone, Monte Nuovo, rose 130 meters almost overnight, burying the village of Tripergole and reshaping the shoreline. The historian unfolds a second document, a letter written by a Neapolitan notary who watched the eruption from a distance. He writes of panic in the streets, of families fleeing the sulfurous haze, and of the sea boiling near the shore. These accounts revealed that the signs of disaster were not always gradual. The Bradycism cycles that define Campi Flegrai's history can turn from slow uplift to sudden catastrophe, with little warning. Over the centuries, the caldera has lifted and subsided repeatedly, sometimes by several meters in a single episode, each movement a reminder that the system beneath Naples is restless and unpredictable. Modern science gives new language to these old fears. Uplift measured in millimeters per day, gas flux in tons, seismic swarms logged by digital networks. Yet the lesson from Monte Nuovo's birth remains, rapid change is possible. The memory of Monte Nuovo's birth, preserved in maps and eyewitness testimony, is not just a relic of the past. It is a warning that beneath the city, the same forces still gather unseen, waiting for their next release. Carbon dioxide invisible and odorless, settles wherever the ground dips. In the Campi Flegre caldera, this simple fact turns topography into a hazard map. The gas, heavier than air, drifts downhill and pools in basements, garages, and low-lying streets, especially in the densely packed suburbs of Pozzuoli and Bacoli, where over half a million people live inside the red zone. Unlike smoke or steam, carbon dioxide gives no warning. There is no color, no smell, no taste, just the silent displacement of oxygen. In the early morning hours, with wind at a standstill, these pockets can become suffocation zones. Geochemists and emergency planners know this risk well. They carry portable detectors calibrated to sound an alarm when carbon dioxide levels cross the threshold for safe breathing. The physics are simple. At just 4% concentration, a room can turn deadly in minutes. The Lake Neos disaster in 1986 in Cameroon, where a cloud of carbon dioxide killed more than 1,700 people overnight, remains a cautionary tale. While Campi Flegre has never seen a tragedy on that scale, the mechanism is the same. Heavy gas, low ground, and no escape. Every street, Every basement, every underpass in the caldera is mapped for vulnerability. These maps, updated with fresh sensor data, guide first responders and civil protection officials as they decide where to deploy monitoring teams. For the 500,000 residents in the red zone, the hazard is not just theoretical. It is written into the geography, waiting for the next windless morning or the next plume to find its way downhill. Protezione Civile's operations coordinator stands over a map of the caldera, tracing the boundaries of the red zone with a blunt fingertip. Forty handheld carbon dioxide sensors, each paired with a trained technician, are logged out from the depot just after sunrise. Their destinations are not random. Deployment routes follow a decision matrix built from years of hazard mapping and live data feeds. Priority goes to the lowest neighborhoods in Pozzuoli, and Bacoli, where past measurements flagged persistent gas accumulation. Each unit comes pre-calibrated, its serial number scanned into the central database before crossing the city limits. The protocol is clear. If any handheld unit records a carbon dioxide concentration above industrial safety thresholds, levels set by health authorities for confined spaces, the reading triggers an alert in the operations room. The matrix then dictates the next steps, escalate to fixed site monitoring, 
notify local municipal offices, and if two or more sensors confirm elevated levels in the same sector, dispatch a mobile air extraction crew. So far, no readings have breached the thresholds for evacuation or public warning, but the system is designed to escalate rapidly if the numbers climb. The coordinator's phone buzzes every few minutes with status updates. Most reports are routine, background levels, wind dispersed pockets, nothing sustained. A few units linger near the upper limit, prompting the team leader to reroute technicians for repeat sampling. The decision matrix, part spreadsheet, part emergency playbook, remains open on every terminal in the command center. Its traffic light logic keeps the city in a state of watchful readiness. Green for normal, yellow for heightened alert, orange for pre-evacuation, red for full mobilization. As of this hour, the lights remain green, but every reading is logged and reviewed, waiting for the first sign that the situation is changing. In the heart of the red zone, a local resident named Lucia stands outside her apartment, portable detector clipped to her jacket. She checks the digital readout and CO2 levels are safe for now, but she knows the routine. Every morning, she joins neighbors in scanning air quality updates posted by the watch group. Their WhatsApp thread hums with sensor readings to street by street. If a value spikes, the group's protocol is clear. Alert the nearest technician, ventilate basements, and check on elderly residents who might not see the warning in time. Lucia's checklist sits laminated by the front door. Windows open on windless nights, garage doors cracked for airflow, car keys, and masks within reach. The numbers are never abstract here. Residents know that the recent CO2 output, over 1,500 tons a day, matches what 20,000 cars would emit in a full year. The comparison is not lost on anyone. For Lucia, it means every low-lying alley, every underground garage, is another spot to watch. Sensors now dot the caldera like sentinels, their network expanding with each new shipment from the regional authorities. Community leaders have started petitioning for more coverage in the outer neighborhoods and for regular public drills. The next steps are practical, expand the sensor grid, run evacuation rehearsals, and push for real-time dashboards that anyone can check from a phone. Lucia's message to the watch list is simple. Stay alert, share every reading, and trust the system, but never let your guard down. Today, Campy Flegre's gas emissions remind us that even the best models can be shattered by nature's unpredictability. As carbon dioxide levels continue to rise, 500,000 people live with uncertainty just beneath their feet. No one knows what tomorrow's sensors might reveal. The volcano's silence is not reassurance. It is a question mark that Naples must face every single day. Let me know your thoughts in the comments.